And, and in starting this sermon this morning, I just want you to know and understand something. There have always been difficult times. How many of you have observed that in your life? Yeah? Ever since we got kicked out of the garden, it's been tough. Ever since Adam and Eve left the place, I, the perfect... As someone said, well, if I just had the perfect job, God bless you. Aren't you special? If I just lived in the perfect neighborhood, and the perfect house, if I just had a perfect whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, Adam and Eve had it all, and they failed, and they got kicked out, and it's been tough ever since. But in every generation, there's been a people who've risen in their most holy faith and said, you know what? I'm not going to let this junk get me down. I'm going to press on for the Lord Jesus Christ because I know in the end we win. Amen? So I want to bring you a portion of Scripture today. And the title of this is, We Believe in God's Victory. We Believe has been our theme this entire year. We Believe in God's Victory. Friends, I want you to know, again, as we consider our world around us, we hear of horrible wars, rumors of wars, terrible actions of evil acting people, and evil groups, and evil gangs, and evil nations. All of these and more make us wonder whether we are living in the last of days or the end times spoken of in the Bible. And, and a lot of times you'll hear this end times, end of days, and you see the cartoons with a guy dressed like some prophet and he's holding a sign, the end is near, you know. And tomorrow he'll be there with a the sign again, the end is near. And the next day, and the next week, and the next month. So people have always had that kind of a concept. Listen, friend, we can choose to live in fear or we can live in the victory that God promised us in Christ Jesus. Our choice. It strictly is our choice, fear or faith, you choose. And there are plenty of people living in fear to the point that it absolutely incapacitates them. That's a horrible thing because life goes on with or without you. And if you choose to live in faith, then God's going to make a way where there seems to be no way and you can indeed rise up in your most holy faith. As I said before, every generation has had difficult times, faced evil people and nations, bent on conquering other nations. It's been so ever since the beginning. Truth be told, this now, today, is the closest you and I will ever get to the end times, except when the day really appears before us. We choose not to fear, but to believe. We choose to live prepared in Christ to face any situation. We make that choice. We choose it. Friends, we choose to arise in our most holy faith. We choose to rest in God's victory. Evangelist Joyce Meyer, I read recently, came to a revelation as she was praying one day. And because no one is perfect, she said, because no one is perfect, humans tend to believe that they cannot do enough or be enough for themselves or anyone else or even for God. And have you ever had that feeling? I, I'm just, I'm not doing enough. I, I'm not enough. Have you ever had those kinds of feelings where you just come to a moment and you said, you know, I, I'm not enough. And as she, as she was thinking along these lines, the Lord revealed to her that, of course, you're not enough. You're never enough. But I'm always more than enough in you. You're never enough, but I'm always more than enough in you. Think of that for a moment. That's exactly why Jesus Christ came. So, friends, we choose to rest in God's victory that Jesus gave us. Now, look, as I said, you turn on the television, the radio, whatever else, you pick up the newspaper, magazines, all that kind of stuff, you're going to see some, some horrible reports. The fact of the matter is, it's always been that way. So don't be soon shaken. Because your faith will cause you to understand in the Word of God you're called more than a conqueror. You are called to the place where you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen? And people who have believed that, people who have lived in that, they've not gotten out of difficult times. But what has happened is they've gotten through difficult times. And God has always, always been faithful. When we come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm going to briefly address these two chapters, first two chapters this morning. I'll be as brief as I can. When Paul was writing to the, third, the church at Thessalonica, he understood what some of the things were that they were going through. They had misunderstood some of his teaching. There had been some people who had written some false doctrines and and as if, and entitled them from Paul. 
There had been some scurrilous things that had happened. Some, some missionaries with evil intentions had come through and preached a contrary gospel. Uh, there, there were, as I said, letters written, and there was all kinds of confusion in the land. And Paul wanted to set this right when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And so he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in, um, of Thessalonians in, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, grace and peace is our heritage. It's our inheritance from God. And friends, if you're not walking in the grace or the peace of God, then you're not walking in your inheritance. If you're not rising up in your most holy faith, then you are forgetting that which will put you over the top. If you're not exhibiting that ability to stand in the grace of God, then you're neglecting the gift of God. And I'm not saying that to put anyone down. I'm just saying it's available to you. If I went out to my house, um, to my garage, and I looked at my car, my one car in the garage, and my, my van parked outside, and I said, ah, oh, those are nice cars. Thank God for them. And I walked the three miles here to church every, every day. I, I, it might be good exercise for me. Perhaps I need a little bit more walking. But the fact of the matter is, if I ignore the gifts of those vehicles... And, and, I, and, I, and I pressure myself physically. I am wasting the time that it takes to get here, you see, by car, by vehicle. If I admire the vehicles sitting on my property but never use them, I'm ignoring something that will help me with my time management, help me with my provision, help me with ministering to the church and so forth. Every time I got a call to the hospital, if I hightailed it down the seven or eight miles to the hospital from here, it would be ridiculous. I jump in the car and I go and I come back again. It's great. And here, grace is just like that. Don't leave grace parked in your garage. Don't leave your faith parked in the front of your house. Use the faith God gives you. Use the grace he gives you and move in it and watch what God will accomplish in you. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows. Would you say, would you say this, my faith grows? Say it, church. My faith grows. Maybe for some of us in this room, that's the first time you've realized that faith is maneuverable. It moves. Faith comes by the hearing of the Word of God. Faith comes by the Word of God. Faith comes. It moves. It can grow. It can dissipate. It can be used. It can be uh, ignored. But friends, faith is a gift from God. It's to move in you to accomplish great and mighty things. So faith will grow exceedingly. And the love of every one of you all abounds towards the other. He said, I've heard about your faith and I've heard about your love and it's marvelous. He was excited to know that in their lives things were happening and moving and yet he knew that there was danger on the horizon. So, verse 4, that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Wait a minute. When I signed up, I wasn't signing up for persecutions and tribulations. You know what I mean? But guess what? Those happen whether you are a believer in the Lord or not. They happen to people. Tough times happen to people, including us. But the difference and the advantage is this, that God who is mighty knows how to see around corners and bring us through to the victory he's already decreed for us in Christ Jesus. He has already issued strength and abilities to you and to me that we are to call upon and to rise up in our most holy faith and experience because of his power in us. Friends, he did not leave us comfortless and he did not leave us powerless. He did not leave us so that we would squander heaven's investment in us. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Hear the word of the Lord. So rise up then. He says, you endure these things. Verse 5, which is a manifest evidence. The mere fact that you're rising above these circumstances, these persecutions, these tribulations and so forth. It's mere evidence 
of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest. Rest means a a, a, pl- a place of remission, a place of relaxation. It, 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 is, it co- is composed of a base word which means quietness. Quietness. A rest. You, you who are troubled, God has given a rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, with angels of his power, the Greek says... God is coming again one day to make things right. Be assured of that in your hearts. If you think the unrighteous get away with stuff, it can cause doom, gloom, and despair in our hearts. Oh my God, they're getting away with it again. Are they ever going to come to a place where God sets things right? Yes, they are. I assure you, and Paul assures these people that are groveling in their hearts at this time, God, we're living for you, and we see the unrighteous rise, and they seem to make it by scot-free. And what is going on? And Paul says to them, be assured, God will not let these things go. There's coming a day when the judgment of God will set things right. I know we don't like to talk about the judgment, but judgment is righteous and just. And everybody said. Now, I know, and I've told you many times, we were judged on the cross. And our sins were judged there. And Jesus Christ himself took our judgment so that we could take the righteousness of Christ, the holiness of Christ, and rise up in that and be God's very own dear children. That's fine and that's good and that's powerful. But friends, judgment will one day come upon this world. And I'm not here to, to wear a long beard and some kind of a prophet's robe and carry a sign that judgment is coming, the end is near. That's not my purpose today. My purpose today says this. In spite of the judgment of God coming, in spite of being in the end times, in spite of all those things, We are still more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who gave himself for us. Hallelujah. And if we don't rise up and take that authority, then friends, just lay down on the ground and be trampled. Because the world is willing to do that to believers if we let them. But rise up. Why? Because we're supposed to be the billboards of God's grace. If we can make it, anybody can make it. If we can rise up in his strength, anybody can rise up in his strength. If we can rise up and see and do the exploits of God that he does through us and in our lives, then friends, anyone is capable of rising to that same level and watching the exploits of God performed through us. My friend, it's not time to set back. See, people had, had, had... had inundated the Thessalonians that that the end had come and everything was over and blah, blah, blah. And they just tried to discourage their hearts. And some of them were wavering even in their faith. But Paul says, don't take that kind of stuff. Jesus will be revealed in the very end times from heaven with his mighty, mighty angels. In verse number 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance or giving punishment on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. He's saying to them, look, eternal punishment is coming. The reason for it is that God is just. Now hear me and hear me well, please. If you live under fear, you're misunderstanding God's grace. If you live under pressure, you're misunderstanding God's grace. There will come a judgment day, but God says that day is coming because he's going to set things right. Friends, the judgment of God is not popular, but the judgment of God is real. It comes one day in the future. Some of these people believed they were living in it right then. It wasn't so. Some people were looking so much for the coming of the Lord. They said, escape, God, escape. That's what we need is escape. And some Christians down through the ages have lived at that point. Even so, Lord Jesus, come now because we want to get out of this mess. And God says to us in turn, I want you to be in the mess to bring light and to bring hope to the darkness. 
I want you to penetrate hopelessness and bring hope. I want you to penetrate people's hearts and lives who are expecting judgment. I want you to tell them their judgment was taken care of on the cross of Calvary, that Christ Jesus bore that judgment for them so that they may be eternally free. And yet there will come a day, and it should stir our hearts as believers in, with a longing to set the hopeless free, in the longing to reach people who do not yet know Him. God have mercy, church. There will come a day when people who have hated God in this life and rejected Him totally and completely, God will say, what is just for you, not, of ang- not out of anger, not out of a capricious attitude, Not having a flippant attitude. You didn't do it our way, so goodbye. But a just God will say, justice for those who reject Christ is to be forever separated from God. Closest thing I can think of is maybe when as a child you're running around the store. Maybe this happened to you. Maybe it happened to your child. Running around the store and all of a sudden You lost sight of your parents and you felt that lost feeling. You ever been there? And, and, or I've seen little kids in church and they're running happy and everything and they run and they grab a leg of somebody and they look up expecting to see dad or grandpa or mom or grandma or somebody and suddenly they recognize, I got a hold of the wrong leg. (laughs) Have you seen their little faces? It's like terror. It's like, what is going on? And see, God never wants us to be stranger to Him because one day we will be with Him forever. But those who reject and continue to reject would be horrified if they grabbed a hold upon Him and looked in the face of God because they don't believe in Him. They don't want anything to do with Him. They want to reject Him. And how horrible would it be for a kind and just God to make them forever be in heaven with Him? Do you hear me? But to be rejected forever. If that's what they choose now, that's what's going to happen in the future. There's a judgment coming. The hell of hell is not the eternal flames. The hell of hell is not the eternal punishment or the eternal agony. It's knowing there is no hope at all. The Calvary's not coming. The troops are not coming to rescue And even God himself will not be there to rescue anyone from hell. Do you follow what I'm saying? What a horrible future. What a horrible thought. What a horrible thing to have in our hearts and our minds. Friend, there is a hell to shun and a heaven to win. Friends, I want you to know this morning, my heart is for the lost. Not because I want notches on my belt for how many people I can get to come to Jesus It's that from the very edge of hell, I want to rescue hearts and lives and say, there's hope for you in Jesus Christ. He, whom to know is life eternal, will rescue your heart from abject fear and bring you a peace that passes all understanding, which will keep your heart and mind in Christ. Rescue from hell is great. It's part of the bargain. But being with God forever... Is the whole package, friends. I want you to know this morning, as Paul wrote to those at Thessalonica, he said, I want you to understand there comes a judgment day. And when he comes, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admitted or to be uh, uh, memorialized or, or appreciated or to see his majesty displayed, to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you is believed. Friends, belief, natural or um, spiritual, is a powerful thing. Let me remind you that in World War II times and just before that, there were many Jews in Germany, high positions in government, in industry, in the military. And those who believe the encroaching uh, ugliness of Hitler and his Nazi regime, they escaped, they got out. But how many of us know there were many Jews who said, look, I'm a secular Jew. I'm a German at heart. 
This is my country. I'm sticking around. They'll never abuse me. Those who believed escaped. Those who did not believe suffered the consequences of not believing in what was right before their eyes. When the word of the Lord says, repent, today is the day of repentance. Come to the love and and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and be set free. Those who believe are released. Those who believe are received in the arms of God. And those who disbelieve, they don't know that destruction is coming. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. I heard a story once about a priest and a rabbi and a minister standing at the edge of the road and they held a sign that said, the end is near. And cars kept going by them, ignoring the sign that they held. And finally, one turned to the other and said, do you suppose we should change the sign to the bridge is out? How many of us want people to get saved because they'll be better husbands or better wives or better sons or better daughters or better citizens in in our country? How many of us know that sometimes wanting someone to be saved so they'll no longer be addicted to drugs or no longer addicted to alcohol or no longer addicted to whatever, how many of us know that's not good enough reason? The end is is near. True, but the bridge is out. And that's why Jesus Christ is heaven's bridge from here to there. The bridge is out, guys. There's no way there except through Christ. And we need in our hearts to know and understand that He is the one who stands in the gap and brings us together with the holy holiness of God Himself. Friends, when He comes in that day to be glorified and His saints to be admired among all those who believe because of our testimony among you was believed. Verse 11, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness. It gives God pleasure to save our souls. It gives God pleasure to take away from us our sins, our guilt, our shame. It gives God pleasure to call us His beloved. It gives God pleasure. Please, please understand you are more loved than you can possibly imagine. You are forgiven further than you can possibly conceive. And you are made accepted in the beloved of Christ. But our response is to believe and receive. The bridge is out, guys. But those who believe and receive him, it says, those who believe, he gives us the power to become his very own dear children. Word declares it clearly. Look again at the scripture, please. And it says this, his, the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of his of faith with power. Why? Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, God is looking for a way to have his glory shine through you and me. God's looking for a way for his glory to be shown in and through our lives. God's looking not only for that, but for us. To be a part of his family. So many Christians are in for the escape ticket from hell. So many Christians are in because they they realize Jesus is the only way. So many people are in just because it's the right thing to do. But are you taking advantage of your relationship with God? Do you really know he loves you? Are you really dwelling in the depths of his love? Or are you just appreciating him? You know, when I thought Aletha liked me, my heart went, woo But I'll never forget the day sitting on her couch in her home or her folks nearby, and 
she was sitting on the on the arm of the of the sofa and I was sitting down below and she looked at me and there was a twinkle in her eye and I just finally I recognized that this jumble of emotions within me was not just like or anything else but it was true love and for the first time in our relationship I said Aletha I love you and I knew the moment I said it that I was committed for life <laughs> truly and I don't mean that in a negative manner I that's how integrous my heart was I I always said I liked you ever since we met but I knew that if I said I loved you I was committed and when I looked in her lovely twinkling blue eyes and said Aletha I love you you would have thought I gave her a gazillion dollars. I, her eyes lit up like nobody's beeswax, and she said, I love you too. Oh, what it did to my heart. I moved from like to love. I, I moved from, wow, this is great, to holy moly. My life is made. You follow? How many believers... Have a liking relationship with Jesus. I like you, Jesus. You heal me. You provide for me. You're nice. You're great. I like you, Jesus. Jesus, you're super. I like you. How many Christians live in a like of the Lord? Friends. Love him who first loved you. Love him who first loved you. I'm not going to be able to finish this. Oh, my mercy. I wanted to so desperately understand and know, please, God has given us the victory. I suppose my point this morning, my major point is this. We believe in God's victory not in the potential doom and gloom of the day in which we live. Look, don't get so zipped up with the coming of the Lord that you forget everything else and you live on edge all the time. Look, he could come any day. I understand that. I know that's, that's what I preach. If you know my ministry, you know that's how I believe and, and the Lord could come at any time. But don't you ever, listen to me carefully, don't you ever take the coming of the Lord as an excuse to sit back and not press on in to what he wants for your life. Please, don't do that. Because you will become ineffective. You will become useless to yourself and to the kingdom. It, it's just like, I choose to be a bump on the lump on the log. I'm not going anywhere, just floating here in the back parts of a lake somewhere, in the corner in a cove. No, 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 no. Rise up. He's called you to be effective. Why not be effective? Don't worry about, about being or doing. Just be concerned about saying, yes, Lord. And you will find he will do great exploits in your heart and in your spirit. Don't, don't, be, don't be swallowed up in the point of, I, I can't do enough or be enough. Friends, you and I will never be enough. We'll never do enough. But he is always more than enough for you and me in our lives. Rest in him, not in you. Would you bow your heads with me, please, for a moment? We're going to go to communion in just a few. I, I don't know if I preach this as best as I could or not, sometimes I say, Lord, I wish I'd have preached that better. And he said, just tell it like it is and I'll take care of the rest of it. Okay, Jesus, I heard you. Maybe you're here this morning, you say, you know, Pastor, I know about God, but I'm not, I don't really have a personal relationship with him. Maybe today's the day when God speaks to your heart and life and says, you know what, this is the moment. This is the moment of grace. This is the moment when God wants to flood into your heart and your life and show you that love that you cannot imagine and have you experience a forgiveness that you cannot even put a finger on and to prove to you that you are made accepted, not because of what you've done or haven't done or this, that, or the other, but because he just makes you his very own dear child through your faith in Christ. 
maybe this is the moment when you say, yeah, it's time for me to trust Christ with my very existence. It's your day. And in this moment, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand quickly, please. We're going to pray for you right where you are. God's going to have his grace shown in your life. Are you ready? Just lift your hand anywhere in the room. Today's the day. Today's the day I surrender everything to him. I give it all to him. I want to belong to him, he to me. Maybe you're here and you say, you know, Pastor, I have a relationship with the Lord, but I want, I I just want to be more strongly aware of His presence in my life. Maybe that's you today and you thought you had to do something to prove that. And I'm telling you, just enjoy your relationship with the Lord. When He says, step to the left, step to the left. When He says, step to the right, step to the right. When he says move this way, move that way. When he says stop, stop. Maybe you've been fighting with yourself. You disqualified yourself for some reason. And God says, stop it. I've already qualified you. Stop. I've already qualified you. If you feel that way, would you just slip up your hand real quickly, please? All across the room. Lord, just want to press in. Just want to press in. Would you pray with me, please, this prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I just come before you today. I yield me to you. I give all of me to you, Lord. I'm going to trust you to work in my life, to accomplish your purpose. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name. That's what he'll work with because you give your all to him. Those helping us with communion, would you come forward at this time, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In just a moment, we're going to participate in communion, the time of a fellowship meal, one with the other just as they're setting up for this be aware that the Passover meal that the Jews celebrated in those days and still do for that matter represent represent the time in Egypt where the instruction was this take a lamb, sacrifice it they had a little depression in their door place that would catch rainwater and such so it wouldn't flood the house and said, kill, kill the, the lamb there and take of the blood and slosh it on the doorposts and on the lintel above that would be already on the threshold. And he said, when the death angel comes over Egypt to take the life of the firstborn of every house among the animals, among humanity, as a punishment against Egypt, the Lord said through Moses, all of those who are behind the blood Listen to this. The death angel would pass over. And then for for centuries after that, they would celebrate that Passover meal and they would remember the blood and they would remember being saved because they would repeat the history to their children. And Jesus had the same custom. He took Passover and with his men remembered the Passover meal when they were delivered from Egypt. But this night was different. This night was just before Jesus would be taken and sacrificed. And so he instituting something new, a new covenant, a new testament in his blood. When they took the bread, he said, now this bread is my body, which is broken for you. He said, take and eat. And as they took that bread, they didn't understand it at first. Jesus, after his resurrection, would explain more about about it to them. And then at the end of supper, he took that cup and he said, now this cup is a new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. It's a new covenant. 
And you see, for the Jewish mind, covenant meant, I promise, boom, that's it. There's no getting out of it. A covenant is a covenant is a covenant. And when they cut that covenant, it was absolutely cast in concrete. And God said this, listen carefully, please. Jesus said this to his men, as long as you do this in remembrance of me till I come, take the bread, take the juice. And for now, all these years, we've done this as churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not have to be a member of our fellowship, the Assemblies of God. You do not have to be a member of our church. We practice an open communion that simply means this. If you're part of the body of Christ, you're privileged to take communion with us as we are privileged to take communion with you. And so that body given by his stripes were healed. Not unusual to have the Lord interrupt us with healing grace. Many people have testified to that point. But the fact is, we're going to have this meal together. You say, well, it's only a little bit of bread, a little bit of juice. Fine. We're having a meal together. It's the meal of promise. It's the meal of rejoicing. It's the meal of his grace. It's only five minutes after. No one sweat sweat the small stuff, okay? We're good. We're good. But this we're going to do until that great day together. We'll celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he who in his worst day prayed a powerful prayer. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I was saved as a small child. I didn't know I was a sinner in need of a Savior until somehow it broke upon my consciousness that I needed the Lord. Others have come to the Lord maybe in their teens or 20s, 30s, middle age and older age and whatever. But each one of us come to that point where we said, God, I can't. I'm not enough. But you can and you are enough. And I surrender to you. I'm going to trust you with everything. Look, friends, I bet my eternity that God is right. I'm not normally a betting man, but I've laid it all on the the line. Guys, I bet everything God's right.